Welcome to the Voodoo Power Podcast. Welcome to Place and Pancakes. We're sitting down today with Chad Lakatis. Coach Lakatis is the head track coach at Edwardsville High School in Edwardsville, Illinois. In his time there, he has lined the trophy case with multiple state, sectional, and conference titles, along with a huge list of Coach of the Year awards. Prior to Edwardsville, Coach Lakatis led Heron High School to three state titles. He earned a bachelor's degree from SIU Carbondale and a master's degree in educational administration from Eastern Illinois University. So welcome to the show, Coach. I appreciate it, Stephen. Thanks for having me on. Man, I'm glad you could make time. I know uh, you're helping with football and you got kids playing and trying to probably get ready for track and all that stuff. So making some time is is really nice. Yeah, well, if there's uh, one thing that I could spend time talking about is 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 what I do, um, you know, coaching and speed training, football and track. And so it's just uh, it's something I, I enjoy, like I said, doing, and I wish I did it more often. Now, researching for all this and trying to find stuff to build questions and kind of build a base, uh, I found Edwards Village YouTube page. Now, does the students do that, or how have you guys set that up where you have so many track and field highlight videos and training videos? How has that come about? So um, I'm not very tech savvy, but uh, I kind of I tinker. I actually run that page myself. So um, yeah, I upload videos. I, um, I have you know athletes video, or I if I do a speed training session, I may t- take some videos and I um, try to dabble into thumbnails and and uh, you know try to try to stay current with with technology. So that that Edwardsville Track and Field uh, YouTube page is is run by me. I spent some time oh earlier this week kind of going through the videos and you've got some really good stuff on there, really highlighting your athletes, but at the same time, train some training videos of your athletes working through some speed drills and different things like that. So you have a really good mix on there. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's, it's part of my job, you know, track and field is, is sometimes doesn't get the love that, that we would all like, but um, I think promoting your kids and your program is, is huge. Um, you know, a lot of these, Colleges don't get an opportunity to come out um, to see your kids run. So just having that available for them, if they want to jump on and check it out, they can. Um, you know, we, we've we adopted the Feed the Cat system a long, long time ago. And, and uh, so a lot of our stuff short and sweet and doesn't take long to run through. Yeah, the, the videos were really well done and they kind of give you a quick reference to maybe something you want to try or how something's done. So having that at somebody's fingertips has to be pretty, pretty nice. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, speed drills and, and speed training is, is YouTube's just saturated with, with things out there. But I, I always think it's important to, you know, follow those people that, that have had success and, um, you know, cause there's a lot of stuff out there that people are just trying to sell and, um, it's not necessarily working, but, I've been in the trenches and, and so it's what we do works here and it's worked at a previous school. And, and so, yeah, I just put it out there for anyone that wants to see it. The other thing I picked up on pretty quick out of the videos is your track team is a very family style atmosphere. Uh, The different videos of looks like at your house, watching tape, you know, you always have them around the different meals you went. Oh, I guess you guys probably stopped at different track meets. So creating that family environment inside your team, what does that take? You know, I think it, it, it just takes connecting with the kids and uh, just taking time and give them time. And, you know, it, it's uh, track is a unique sport where you can build those relationships. It's, it's uh, you know, if I'm screaming and yelling at practice, then I'm doing something wrong. But, uh, you know, building those relationships and, um, this is my 20th, this will be my 20th year as a head coach, uh, 24th year overall coaching track and field. So I, I've established some, you know, just things that we do and, and, um, you know, having kids over at the house to, to have a pasta dinner for a pre-state meet, you know, it's, it's, uh, just what we do. And, and the kids, the kids seem to enjoy it. And, um, you know, I started that back at Heron when I, first started uh first had the opportunity to be a head coach and you know kids kids enjoy that i remember i remember as a kid um well i wasn't a kid i was a sophomore in high school and uh 
Tony Holler was my basketball coach. And uh, <clears throat> he invited me over to his house uh, to watch to watch film. And I, I was with the juniors and seniors, and I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. And uh, his son, Alec, was there, which is now my coaching staff. But uh, just being there was just – it just did something. You know, I just I, – I felt like I bought into everything he said and did. And, you know, he brought me into his family. And uh, I think that's important because if kids trust you and um, you, you make them feel part of the family, you know, because a lot of our kids are coming from – you know, broken homes or whatever it may be, but uh, at least one place they can feel feel safe, and and so we just try to provide that for them. Now, you, you talked about Tony there a little bit. You ran for Tony back in high school, and obviously played basketball, like you said, pre feed the cat system. So, when did the switch come, and what drew you into this style of coaching? Well, I knew the style of coaching that that he provided for me wasn't for me. Um, I, I despised track at that time. Uh, I did it just because I felt like I needed to, um, you know, so obviously later in life, I, I volunteered at Harrisburg high school. He was also a football coach and I helped. Um, I was just in, in college going to Carbondale and, and I helped with the freshman football team and he was the, one of the coaches. And, um, you know, I knew that he started to change cause it, this was the late nineties, uh, 98, 99. And they started having some success and bringing home trophies. And, you know, I was following close along and I was ending my college career. And, and, uh, I actually landed a job at Heron high school, as you mentioned earlier. And, uh, we were in the same conference and, I was an assistant that at that time and you know Harrisburg would always kick our butts and and of course the competitor that that we all are as as coaches you know it's uh I wanted to find a way that what can we do to be as good as them and uh so I went to a clinic at Bureau Valley and Tony Holler was speaking at that in 2001 and I was fr- I sit in front and center and um, I think I filled out a whole notebook of, of all his notes and sayings. Um, he even had a VH, VHS video that he was selling. Um, I actually messaged him and he sent one to me for free, uh, I guess because of, of uh, he felt bad for torturing me in high school. But uh, no, he sent it to me and I studied it. And um, I was an assistant, as I said, in 2001, 2002 at Heron. And I was just running kids to death like how I was trained and uh, couldn't understand why they weren't liking it, you know. And then so I implemented this uh, in 2003, 2004 at Heron, and my numbers went from like, you know, 12 kids to 30 to 30 to 40. I started getting the best athletes out in school, all the football players, and uh, the rest is history. So let's – Talk about Heron there a little bit then, because it, it's a small Illinois school, 1A. Yep. It'd, be, it'd be very uh, comparable to where I live. So the numbers you're talking about are very comparable to the numbers that we're seeing. I mean, track is in a decline around this part of the country. I don't think coaches have seen the changes that different states have made and maybe adapted, and they also have an influx of other sports, uh, baseball, softball, they're fighting. Uh, you have to find a way to get those athletes out. Do you credit the way you changed taking all that volume out to it, or is there more to the story? It was 100% the volume. Um, the type of kids that, that are fast, you know, this, this bouncy, you know, just like a cat. They want to lay around, be lazy. They get up and, and go fast. Um, I created an environment that was attractive, and that's what, that's the whole, you know, I don't want to say the whole theory and behind it, but it just, it attracts them and we feed them and, you know, when they're hungry, they come back for more. And so you give them time off and you bring them back and they just keep wanting more. And it's, it's uh it's 100% because of the philosophy, I believe that attracts that type of athlete. Now, when we were getting this thing set up and we were trying to get our computers aligned and all that, we talked about football there a little bit and you said you coach freshman football. What would be the carryover 
for you or is there one from how you coach track to how you coach football? Well, that's, that's a good question, you know, because, uh, football coaches are, are typically, you know, I don't want to say always, but they're the grinders, you know, they, they stay late, they watch film, they think more's better. Um, you know, we start in the summer with our kids and we speed train. That's all we do. We, we get on the field, we put cleats on or we get on the track. I, I bring out my free lap system. We do flies, we do, you know, forties, we do starts, we do plyos, we test the vertical, you know, it, it feels very similar to that of a track practice for me anyway. Um, and then, you know, once we start grinding some X's and O's, it, it does become a little bit different, but I, I still try to carry on that mindset of connection. You know, um, I'm an educator, you know, I teach, I think, I think it's important not to forget that it's, you know, obviously we like to win. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, it's, you know, these kids belong to somebody else and, and I've got two boys and I know that I would love for them to be coached, um, the right way. And I think they're, you know, there's an old school way and there's a new school way. And, you know, not that kids have changed. I think adults have changed a little bit and we say the kids have changed, but, you know, I think that's, uh, I've tried to be consistent. You know, at times I, I do get heated, but you know, that's just the name of the game. Football's a, a tough sport and, and you battle, but, uh, as far as the overall philosophy, I, I, I we try to keep our practices limited. Um, I'm not the head, uh, freshman football coach, but I do encourage, our kids to be, you know, fresh and, you know, maybe not going two and a half, three hours of practice. Let's go out and have two hours, you know, taper down as we get closer to game day. And so we do try to be smart with the kids being on their feet and the rest and recovery approach. Now I'd never thought of this and I got a chance to talk to Chris Corfus and he kind of brought it to light. So I do prep cast. So I go to all the games and get to watch it pregame while we're setting up and all that. High school football, 70-minute pregame, they start the clock. I'm shocked at how many coaches have those kids out there for the full 70 minutes pregame just to turn around and run them back out for another full game. In your system, are you always cognizant of how you have the kids on the field even into the pregame? Yeah, you know, we – we have a routine. We we bring our kids out about you know if if the game time, it's it's pretty much forty minutes before game time. We do a a light pat and go, um, and then you know with about thirty minutes left, we do speed drills for ten minutes. You know we do our our a skips, our pogos. You know it looks like speed drills that you'd see at a track practice, and we'd go through ten and their quality. And uh, then we give them a quick break for, for water and we do some offense and we do some defense, probably about eight plays on each side. And so, you know, we're, we're not hooping and hollering and yelling and screaming and clapping. We're, we try not to get too high, but, but our approach is again, I think it's still under that mindset of, you know, let's, let's have a quality warm up. Let's, let's not overdo it. Um, you know, we're not going to win pregame. Um, other teams do. And uh, so we just try to be smart with that. Now, a little bit further back in the podcast, you talked about, you know, you, you got boys on the team, you got boys in high school, and you get to coach them. That's something that we haven't talked about much on the podcast with any coaches, but coaching your kids, how do you make the relationship as the coach be the same as it is for other kids and not just use your kid as an, ex as an example all the time how do you maintain the fun for your kid well that's a that's a great question and and uh my answer to that might not be the same as what my son would say but you know um i i try not to call him out you know if he needs to be directed on a drill i i'm not afraid to um if he needs you know a little motivation to you know, if it's a tough workout day, you know, lactate day, we we may have to peel some guys up off to 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 get in another rep. But I just try to treat him like everybody else. And um, you know, obviously, there's internally, it's it's there's more, but I still I still want success 
as much success for him as, as all the other kids. And, you know, um, it, it's, it's different, but I think that, um, he, he does the hurdle. So in track he's with Alex, some, so not having him, you know, the full time, I think is a nice balance, but, uh, yeah, I think the, at the end of it, it's, it's, uh, just try to treat him like all the other kids. And, uh, I may be harder on him at times. And I, I think that I've reflected and, you know, his freshman year, he, he was, you know, just a baby deer and just trying to figure it out. And, you know, last year he was an all state four by one, four by two guy. And, you know, the kids respect him. Uh, we test so much. Um, he actually was on the four by one, four by two state qualifying team as a freshman. Um, and because we test so much, we had so much data, it was, it was there for all the kids to see. So it wasn't like he was getting, you know, bullied, like, Hey, your dad's a coach. That's the only reason why you're getting to run. Um, data spoke for itself. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously I, I, it's, it's tough at times, but I try not to carry it home. I tell him good job. I try to stay positive and you know, it's, uh, we don't talk a whole lot about it because he's a teenager. He, 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 you know, he goes into his room and, and, uh, he shuts the door and that's how most of them are. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, like I said, I try to treat him like everybody else. Now you kind of touched on it there, but how long did it take for you to learn that maybe the house was safe and you, you had to shut it off? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's tough at times. I mean, cause you know, when things don't go well, you know, sometimes you bring home uh, that frustration or disappointment, and um, you know, at the like I said, it's just these kids are young, and I I try not to make such a big deal because I don't want him stressing about his performance, or you know, I just want him to be a kid, and I don't want him feeling like oh my my dad's doing this or that, but it's you know I've done this long enough, and he and he's gone to the state track meet you know every year, and he's you know, he's a coach's kid and, and I wasn't like that. My dad's was a, in the medical field. And so, you know, I was listening to Tony talk and he, you know, he was a coach's kid too. He was in the locker room. He, he saw the ups and downs at homes, the wins and losses. And, you know, um, so Clayton got to see that and, and my younger son as well. So it's, I think it's different for coaches kids cause they've always been around it. Um, so maybe that's a little bit easier transition for both of us. Now, when you got to Edwardsville, what was the program like? <laughs> um, not like it is now. It's, uh, um, it was, it was a distance school. Um, they didn't have, uh, a lot of the better athletes out. Um, the records were not very good. I think we've, we've broken every jump, sprint, hurdle, the only jump record we didn't get, we haven't gotten is triple jump, and we were one inch off that. Don't have the pole vault. We don't have the 1,600, and we don't have the 4 by 8 So every other record's been shattered. So it's it was uh, not in a great place. Um, and now it's one of the top high schools in the, in the state of Illinois. So when you got there – You've talked about Alec, and I know your other coaches are just an incredible staff, but you had to build all that, and then you had to get the kids out. Coming into a new school, new coach, how were you able to start setting that up, and then how long did it take to see some of that stuff really blossom? Yeah, you know, um, I, I've always known that it's important that you're only as good as, as your assistants, and um, there's so many moving parts in track and field, you need to make sure you have competent coaches in, in each area. Um, my former school at Heron, it was, I was, you know, the distance coach, the hurdles coach. I had a volunteer jumps coach. You know, I, I had a distance guy, but he wasn't there every day, but I pretty much did everything at a smaller school. You can do that. Um, at a bigger school, uh, it's, it's more difficult. So my first thing was to, to build the pieces and to make sure that, um, you know, we, we got competent coaches. I try to get as many coaches that, that coach football as possible, which, um, which I accomplished. I, I was brought in as a varsity coach. And then, uh, after my second year, I moved down to freshman 
just the timing with, with my little ones was, it just was so much time, but, uh, I surrounded myself then with, with Kerry Bailey, coach Bailey. He's my jumps coach. He, um, was on the football staff. Um, of course, Alec Holler was on the football staff. Uh, he's my hurdles coach. Um, my throws coach was coach Martin at the time. He was the head football coach. Um, so you can kind of hear the trend of football track. And then my pole ball coach was a football coach as well. And so, um, my distance guy, uh, he was, he was the cross country coach. So that was, that was start. That was the beginning of trying to get everything aligned. And then being involved with the football program, we, we encouraged the kids to, you know, our better athletes to, to sprint. And I had already was well into feed the cats. You know, I had done it at Heron. I was a head coach for five years. I'd done it six years there. And basically I just did the exact same thing. I fed the cats here. We started timing. Um, we started doing all the things that, you know, that bring them out and record, rank, publish. And, um, you know, it slowly, it slowly began to, to blossom, but that the, my very first group here, I was 2009, I could tell the freshman group was pretty special. Um, it, it ended up being a special group because 2012, we got second in state. So those freshmen that came in, they bought in, 100% bought in, and they were talented too. Um, but that was, you know, four years down the road was our first trophy. Now you build the track program up. You're having success. You have really good assistant coaches. How do you keep those guys? How do you keep everybody happy and not other schools picking them off because of your success? Any one of those could coach about anywhere they want. So what makes Edwardsville special? Um, well, I'd like to say that we're all friends, which I think is important. Um, but more importantly, I, I don't micromanage. Um, I feel like I, you know, obviously I oversee everything. I feel like more of a CEO. I feel like some of my assistants might be a better coach than me. Um, but I have strengths and weaknesses and, and so does each one of them, but I, I do not micromanage. I let them run their program the way they want. Um, you know, my sprint practice is finished in, you know, 20 to 40 minutes. And when I'm done, I'll, I'll walk around and I'll, I'll just watch. And, um, you know, if they want to create a web page or a YouTube video and, and, uh, if they want to branch off and make t-shirts for their, for their group, you know, I know our throwers do it. Um, heck my jumps coach has got two tattoos now from his state champions. Um, and, uh, I just let them run their, their events and let them take ownership. And I think that that makes them feel like it's theirs. And when you do that, I think that's what all young men want. And, um, you know, even though I'm sitting in the, the head coach seat, I, I feel as an equal to, to all of them. Now avoiding complacency in the athletes and the coaches, you've developed this, you're winning everything is, you know, kind of what, maybe what you had envisioned, but now you have to maintain it. And that may actually be harder in some regards. So how do you guys just keep perpetuating this thing? Yeah. You know, we, we've been blessed with, just incredible talent um you know and it's it's not that you know when i run across names like aj epinesa uh travis anderson brandon battle ryan watts i mean those were all all american type status kids for us at edwardsville um aj and travis actually went through at the same time they were part of the 2015 and 2017 state ch uh, championship team um of course aj uh, set the record in the disc and Travis in the, in the one tens and, um, AJ plays for the Buffalo bills now, you know, and, um, to, to maintain it, you just have to continue to make your program attractable. Um, it, there's a buzz that track is fun. That's, um, you know, I post things, I have a Twitter page, I, I have a YouTube, um, we have like 10 different uniforms. I've got, uh, a conference uniform, a sectional uniform, um, Madison County uniform. I got a prelim state uniform. I got a state finals uniform, you know, look good, feel good. Um, we try to invite the best 
athletes to our meets. Um, Allie does a great job at promoting, um, you know, the hurdles and, and getting um, at bids for some of our big meets and, you know, just promoting our kids, getting things on the announcements, them seeing themselves on social media, um, and then success breeds success. You know, kids at the middle school level, they see, they see, I go to meets, you know, my son's an eighth grader. So I've, I've kind of been at middle school meets for a very long time now with my older one being a junior and my younger one, eighth grade. So my face is there. I'm high-fiving those kids at, at that age and, and a very impressionable age that is. And I just think you just gotta, you just gotta keep being you, but continue to make it attractable. Now the different things you brought up in there, I mean, you understand kids really well. You'd like to think all coaches and all teachers do, but I don't know that that's always the case. So overcoming the age and generation gap and figuring out what they like that keeps drawing them in. What kind of effort did that take from you and your coaches? Well, my staff is younger, so I think they had a, they had a better grip on, you know, that age, you know, just being closer in age with some of the, the, the kids. And then, you know, me, myself having kids, you know, it just kind of was a natural, you know, path for, for me to kind of pick up on, you know, I'll bring a jukebox to practice and I'll throw on some, you know, music they listen to and, you know, try to make it fun, you know, and, and, uh, that's what these guys like. They want to have fun, short, sweet, go home. And so I think that connection was right there at home. Now, as kids come into the program, it seems like athletes are taught at a really young age that they always need to be doing more, always need to be doing more. How much of a struggle is it sometimes to get a kid to realize you you don't need to do more? You need to do what we're telling you, and you will have success. That's uh, that might be one of the biggest topics that that I struggle with, and it's um, you know, I, I think I think parents in general they're all after that scholarship. Um, they're all after you know parents want their kids the best for their kids. And I totally get that. But I think at some point we have to stay, take a step back and we have to really put the kids first. And, and when you put the athlete first, you know, you have to listen to them. Um, you can see if a kid is enjoying something, you can see if a kid's not, you got to have real talks with them. You know, my son came to me as a freshman, actually as a sophomore during uh, football season, it ended. He was probably the number one uh, freshman basketball player. Uh, and he came to me and he said he didn't want to play basketball. And I said, fine. Well, I mean, it was more than just fine. We had we had a lot of talk about it, but he, he just, it was so much, you know, football and, and, and basketball and those two sports are a grind. And, and he wanted to get ready for track. I didn't talk him out of it. Um, he, that was just a decision that he made, but it's it's tough. You know, I, I, um, I lose kids to, to, you know, soccer, um, select soccer or, or kids that are at Academy and they can't even run for us. They can't even play at the, the, their own high school soccer team. Um, you got AAU basketball, which is huge. You know, lacrosse is starting to push its way in, in our area. And, you know, it's, it's just when our kids leave our practice, I know that some of them, go to seven on seven football. They, they go to another practice, but I feel like that's even more of a reason for me to be smart with how I train them. You know, um, there's a lot of things that I would like to do, but I also know that they're going to leave and do more. And so I try to encourage them, but obviously I can't joystick them. I can, I can tell them that rest recovery is the most important thing for them. But, uh, those kids and their parents have a different agenda. So working through the other sports like you're talking about, I mean, kids get a lot of stuff slapped on their plate, but you're always looking for athletes that can come out and help the track team. So do you go to other sports and you, I mean, obviously you you work at the school, so you know who's good and you know who's not. How, how do you convince them that track is the right thing for them to do? Uh, you know, if it's a basketball player, I tell them that I can increase their vertical and they'll be dunking like a madman. Um, if it's a 
football player, I'll tell them, you know, you want to run away from everybody. If, if so, then I can get you faster. You know, obviously baseball is a tough, tough deal with it being the same season, but I tell them if they want to steal bases, they can get faster and come do indoor. You know, I, I try to tell them what they want to hear. And, and, you know, if they work at it, you know, we can get a kid going, you know, 20.2 miles per hour and get him going 21, you know, 21.8, you know. And so if they can improve uh, 1.6 miles per hour, it's it's huge for their particular sport. And um, I think that you, you, you can't BS them, but you got to tell them what they need to hear. And, um, you know, at the end of it, it's, it's, uh, you know, I'm just trying to make them the best athlete possible. And, uh, I tell them just sometimes just give me an opportunity, come, come to a week's worth of practice and see if you have fun, see if you like it. And usually most of them that do that, they end up staying. I've been talking to a few kids out here at the gym about this a little bit. So let me talk to a guy who does it on a daily basis. You're getting a basketball player straight off season. There's not much break between basketball and track. Basketball is filled up, certain buckets, acceleration, plyometrics, things like that. How do you structure that to fill up the buckets that need it while give them the rest from the things that are overworked? Well, we have that scenario a lot of times, year in and year out. My first thing is I tell them to take a week off and enjoy that week be a kid, have fun, hang out with your friends. Um, you know, a lot of times they don't want a week. Uh, sometimes they want more than a week. And so I just try to be flexible and real with them. And, um, you know, if, if they continue on with AAU schedule, we talk about what meets I would like them to be at. And so that's, that's planned and structured. And, um, you know, typically our practices don't last long, so I don't think there's really any any interference with 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 practices. It's more of a you travel. You know, if they have to be gone for a big invite one weekend, so so what? You know, I I tell them conference sectional and state is where I need them, and there's a handful of other meets uh, that we could use them. Um, you know, if if their basketball is the number one priority, I, I try to I try to you know respect that and, and make sure I listen. And that's important. Listen to what they have to say, you know, or, or, and, or their parents. It's Cause sometimes I'm dealing with the parents and, and they're, they're in the driver's seat. So, you know, it's, it's just listening to them and try to make some sort of compromise with it. Success through flexibility. I don't know that every coach may see it the way you see it. Do you feel like giving the athletes room to do what they really want to do? And then you taking what's left has helped your program. Yeah, I think I think that the kids quickly can feel that we care about their health. Um, you know, track and field is a sport where you have to be a hundred percent. It's it's different than some of the other sports, but you know, um, if if you show that you show love and you show that you care and and it's okay if they miss a meet for whatever reason it may be, you know, just the communication part is, is huge for me. And, you know, we just, we're trying to develop them as an athlete and, uh, they're, they're not going to be any good for us, uh, if, if they're worn down and, and banged up. And so I think that trust and, uh, you know, them knowing that we care about them is, is it goes a long way. Now, Tony will say it, and I know you've said it, that uh, speed grows like a tree. So yep. teaching teaching yourself to be patient, and especially with the male athlete, because it seems like you know you don't know when that big growth spurt's coming, and they could be slow, 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 and then all of a sudden they grow into themselves, their legs quit hurting, growing pain stop, and now they're fast. How have you learned to be patient with the process and just let it develop? Uh, well, yeah, it's it, that's it's tough for – you know, for them, more importantly, because, you know, I, I convince them that they're going to get faster and they, they do naturally, but, you know, you just, you just got to keep grinding and be patient, keep working hard. And sometimes, sometimes kids don't get where they want to. Um, and that's okay. You know, if, if it doesn't work out or they don't, you know, sometimes setting goals is good and bad. I think that, 
you know, you just got to go crush every practice workout. You know, some kids may not get an opportunity to run at every meet, but we recorded every practice. So that's their opportunity to try to get better. And, you know, um, I think that when they try to chase a time, a mark, you know, sometimes that's not the best approach, you know, and uh, just it, just having those little conversations just like this, you know, just be pe patient, trust the process, you know, just, you know, one day at a time. You know, and it's it's sometimes it's hard. We we had a kid years ago. Uh, his name was Grant Matarelli. He was a freshman. He was a great football player, probably 140 pounds, wet, five uh, ten, great kid, four year, three year starter varsity, and uh, he ran track his freshman year. We tried to pole vault him, and he he just wasn't really fast. Um, COVID hit. It was bad. Let's see, that was maybe junior year, sophomore year, junior year. He didn't come out his sophomore year, junior year of COVID. Senior year, he came out. He was actually my lead leg on the 4 by one He was lights out and um, had a good football season. Uh, Alec actually coached him. He's like, you'll never believe who's the fastest kid on the field. And he said, Graham Adarelli. And it's the same kid that I'm like, this kid, it's going to be a challenge because he he wanted to be fast. and and But, again, he, he, he wasn't fully developed. He was a small freshman, and he was lights out as a senior. And, and you know, there's stories after stories just like that. And um, th there's some stories that some kids come in, and they just kind of stay flatline. They, there's not much improvement. And sometimes it's their body type and, and uh, the things they do outside. But we don't have control of that. But just being impatient and, um, you know, it's, uh, it's tough at times. It, it's a very mental, as you know, it, it can be a mind struggle and that a lot of times that's what you're dealing with. And the key is, I guess, not to run them off in the process. So while you're waiting for them to develop, you still have to treat them like an athlete that's going to be good, even though you're not seeing it right then. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. And, you know, I, I tell them we, we try to love them up sometimes and throw them in meets, but you know, some in our area, you got two, two per event and you know it's the top two and you know sometimes it's the top three and they, there's some kids that they may go forth through four years and the first three years they they didn't get to run at very many in, invites but you know what those three years they're they're getting a vertical they're getting a 200 time trial they're getting a 10 meter fly they're getting a 40 yard dash they're getting high fives um you know and they're part of a team that is fun and competitive and they only have to be there for 30 minutes and then they're gone so it's it's you know any holidays is time off no saturday sunday practice unless it's a saturday meet so these kids get to truly be a teenager and uh i think that they continue to come back and uh, again building those relationships is important because they want to be around that atmosphere it's a positive environment and uh, i think that all kids most kids should be attracted to that at this time in society that we're living in. Teaching those hard body positions to sprinters. What, what are some things you incorporate to help your sprinters find that without just telling them? I mean, there has to be drills and stuff that you implement to really get the shin angle changed, to get the good acceleration phase in there. Those real tough positions to maintain and hold. Yeah, you know, it's it's uh my my main philosophy is max speed. And so we we spend the minor, majority of our time around there. Um I think at at this point of of the athlete's age, we can improve form. Um we do a ton of wickets. Uh but we talk about posture a lot. You know, staying tall, um good arm action, you know, uh so staying tall, uh, good arm action, and good front side. And, and we do the good front side, you know, with the knee and, and toe. We, do, we just do a lot of wickets. And I think that's about one of the only drills that truly can improve sprint mechanics is going through wickets high speed. And um, so we just do a ton of them. I got six inch, and we'll, we'll have a line of five feet apart for my kids that can't open up very well. Um, and then we'll open up from six to six and a half to Brandon battle, my triple count crown 
winner. He he won the one, two, and four his senior year. Um, he was he was close to seven. So we we just have different ranges, and we just we just rep it. We rep it. We video. We watch video. We slow mo it. We talk about it. Um, some of the drills on the front end that we do, we do 10 speed drills. They may vary from day to day, but those usually we can see if a kid's doing something wrong and his mechanics at high speed usually goes back to something they're doing during those drills. And I'm not near as smart as, as Corpus and Holler and, and I don't have that science background, but, uh, to use all the big fancy words, but, uh, that's where we that's where we try to fix it you know through the wickets and speed drills and a lot of videoing now you've talked about quite a few really good athletes through this conversation that you've had and and coached coaching the prodigy athlete as much as of a blessing as it is it's it's something that you always have to worry about in the back of your mind i'm sure that everything you do is to help the athlete and you don't want to see anything happen to him because you know what's invested. How have you been able to do that with so many great athletes? Well, it's, it's, uh, it is stressful. Um, you know, because I'll be honest with you that these athletes could have gone anywhere and been special. Um, you know, I, I did not make Eric Thompson a seven, two high jumper. He was 24, foot three inch long jumper. I didn't do that. Um, AJ, of course I didn't coach Travis. He was more of a hurdler. Brandon, I had, you know, it's, it, I, it's stressful. I, I just pray that I don't screw it up. <laughs> you know, um, I listen to them just like I do all the other athletes. You know, I remember Brandon's senior year, we were going into a, a pretty big meet and I had mapped out every, every meet, working backwards from state meet and i said okay these are the events you're going to run and these are the workouts you're going to do and i know it an elite athlete like that you just can't overdo it and so we had a plan and one invite can't remember which one it was he's like coach i just don't feel right I said no problem you don't have to run he's like coach i want to i'm like nobody's going to remember this invite the only one they're going to remember is the state meet and we've got a goal, and that goal is for you to win all three. He was on the four by one, all four, and um, so yeah, just just listening to them, having a plan. Um, don't think you have to do something special. You know, it's these these kids are already gifted. Uh, you know, the rest and recovery <laughs> is even more important with the elite athletes and. Uh, you know, understanding that if they're coming off a of PR, maybe we need to back off that next week. Uh, you know, just just not being greedy and throwing that stud in four events for 12, 13 straight invites. You know, and I see it. I see it all the time. And then come to the sectionals, these kids either A, don't even qualify or they're pulling up lame and the finish of their race. And it's they've been hammered all the way through season. So I, I think that you just have to be smart with it. You have to listen to them and you have to make sure they enjoy it because there's stress on their end as well, because they, they know they're pretty special and uh, you also have to keep them humble to make sure they don't get too big headed um, and just tell them to trust the process. And uh, again, some of those relationships I built with those kids is, you know, uh, our lifetime and uh, it, Coach and Brandon and some of these other guys were were a true joy. And, and although yes, it was stressful, it, it was a lot of fun too. So I try I try to make sure I hold on to that. And and I forgot about all the nerve wracking times when he came to me about not being able to run. But I just said, let's not run. You know, listen to your body, and that's what you got to do. If good judgment comes from bad judgment, <laughs> and a lot of it, you were talking about not getting greedy. Did you learn to have that good judgment through bad decisions earlier in your career or were you just gifted with this ability to say, yeah, we're just not going to run today? No, I, I've, I've made some poor decisions. I've made one that sticks out of my head was when I was at Heron. Uh, I had a really good sprinter. His name was Rocky Benjamin. 
Um, he qualified for state in the 100 as a freshman. We, in Class A, was pretty fast. I think it was like 1098 as a freshman. Um, and fast forward to his senior year, it's when they were still doing prelims. So it was 2000 and I think it was 2005, maybe, t- no, 2006. I try to get greedy with him, and I try to go one, two, four by one, four by two. And prelims of the one, two ran in the front end. If you, you may or may not remember that, but they were. And so he ran the 100, qualified, ran the 200. It wasn't very good. And then you got about 30 minute rest and the four by one comes up. Well, he was my lead leg. We had the best time in one a by far. We probably would have been state champs and he petered out. He couldn't get to my outgoing runner on the two leg in the first exchange. And that still haunts me that decision of me trying to be too gritty. And, um, he didn't want to run it. And I was young in my coaching career and, um, that haunts me you know i still think about it in fact his son his son runs for here and he was on the state championship four by one four by two team he's got a different last name but he's he's lights out and i promised myself i'd never do that to another athlete and i've held true to it i figured that maybe you had had some experiences in there that had taught you to be a little more uh careful in your decision making it seems like that's how we all have to learn for sure yeah, 100%. I think that as as teachers, you know, coaches, you know, we have to we have to evaluate and reflect and um you know, I think that's how we continue to get better. Looking online, I found a PDF that you had put out, you know, that kind of breaks down some of the different things you do to get athletes ready. And starting a ways out, it looked like you had a general period, and then as you get closer to the season, you have a more specific period and then you reach a competition phase. So what do those periods look like for you, and how do you set them up? Well, um, again, things change over time, and, you know, I keep I keep my workouts that I've done, you know, every year, whether it's the sprints, the everything. And so you go back through and you reflect on things that work and don't work, and there's things we've done that we no longer do and, you know, vice versa. There's some staples that we always do. And, and so, you know, heading into the season, I think it's important for us to try to get a 16. And this is, this is for me and us, you know, starting after Thanksgiving, uh, 16 max velocity, uh, speed workouts, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's done from, the end of November all the way to, to February. So we go twice a week. So it's micro dosing. Um, and in between there we do, we try to do X factor days. Uh, we're basically, I know you've heard Tony talk about X factor. It's, it's basically in a nutshell. If you walked into practice, you probably would look like we're not doing anything. Um, but you're, you're getting after it for about four or five seconds and you're doing 15 to 20 reps or whatever it may be, box jumps, hurdle jumps, you know, whatever you have prepared for that day. Um, so, you know, we get the 16 in and we continue to do functional training. Um, we do a lot of single leg stuff cause we're running on one leg at a time. Um, and then, and this is all geared towards trying to gear towards the first indoor meet, which is, you know, mid to late February. So then once we get those 16 in, I I try to get a handful of speed capacity workouts in, which basically is just more reps, less rest, you know, maybe an example like five by forties, you know, run a 40 walk back sprint again. Uh, We can be done in 10 minutes and then, you know, that's it. Or or maybe it's 10 by twenties or whatever that speed capacity. So I try to get a handful of those in before we go to lactate. And then with lactate, uh, again, I try to get at least two to three sessions in and a lactate is, is, is a system energy system that you're pushing beyond 10 seconds. Um, you know, we only do maybe one or two of them, like a, maybe a 23 second drill. And first time we do it, we may just do one. Uh, second time we do it, we may ask of two with complete recovery. 
and so that's kind of my that's kind of my path of lately uh the last five years or so um we try to get through now each one of those you know max speed speed capacity and lactate i may not get i may not hit that number um but we try to get to it as close as possible because you know max speed is is again that's what drives everything but at some point you know we got to get our kids ready for the 200 or 400 and um and then basically after that through the season you know we 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 continue to based on our week you know and how it's mapped out we, we may try to get a lactate in a handful of them in um but we're doing high speed handoffs which is max speed um we may do a, a just a 10 meter fly on a day just to get excited you know and but uh, through the season we get a lot of our stuff done through meets and uh we we back off and uh, if there's not a lot of meets we'll, we'll do a workout or two but um that front end 16 speed sessions max speed you know 14 to 16 try to get you know three to four speed capacity uh you know and then two to three lactate and sometimes we don't get hit those numbers and, and that's okay because the first indoor meet we're not trying to win anything we're just trying to get our prepa kids prepared um and then obviously you know we didn't talk about acceleration and block starts i mean that stuff sprinkled in along the way um you know we have event specific days where we will do some technical stuff like that um but typically we start off with two days a week and then starting in february march april in May, we add a day. So at the end of the year, we're sometimes we're at five, some, sometimes we're still at four days a week. Um, we might bring a special group in on a uh, Wednesday to do, you know, that it may be our more elite group that we're doing handoffs or block starts with, but, uh, that's, that's been my approach. Um, we've seemed to have some good luck and, and kids respond very well. Um, last year I, I regret, I wanted to have a workout on a Sunday. It was Mother's Day, and I felt bad bringing them in, and so I didn't, and I still regret. I felt like we could have been better at the state meet and the 4 by 4 and prelims if I had gotten that workout in. But, uh, again, those those things are noted, and I'll try to do better for this up-and-coming season. When you hit the heart of your season and you're sprinting, jumping, all the things you're doing two days a week or however many meets you have, which I think here's a lot of times two days a week, what does your other three days look like? Are they X factors? Are they rest? How do you set that up? Yeah, so we have uh, faculty meetings on a on a Wednesday after school, so the kids so the kids go home, and so I, I don't bring our kids back. Um, the makeup of our sprint group speaks for itself. You know, they go home, they're sleeping within that hour, and they're caddy you know, they go home and fall asleep. That's the last thing they want to do is go for back to school for a workout. I, I respect that. Um, my son's a cat. I was a cat. So I get that. Um, the other days consist of, you know, could be X factor. Um, it could be in, in each X factor day, we try to make different, whether it's broad jumps or vertical jumps or whatever we can make up, you know, it's, it, I mean, you can just, you can be as creative as possible on those days. Just, just don't get your kids hurt. Um, and then, yeah, rest days, you know, there, I think that practice sometimes, I don't want to say is overrated because I think that you can get a lot accomplished. Um, but I think it's about being smart with, with your approach and, um, understanding that, taking a day off is, is probably just as good, if not better than bringing them in for, you know, a 30 minute workout. And, uh, so the other days, again, you know, if we have a Friday, if we had a Friday invite, I might try to bring him in on a Monday with something tougher, you know, a Tuesday be a, an X factor, um, Wednesday off Thursday, pre-meet pre-meet consists of, you know, block starts, straights, curves, those guys that are competing. We do handoffs. You know, if it's indoor or outdoor, it may change on how we're doing handoffs or what we're doing. And then, you know, my all my other coaches are doing their thing. 
And, um, you know, that, so that's what that week would look like. If, if we had a Saturday invite, we may come back with, you know, similar format with Monday, a lactate or something, uh, or maybe it's max speed, depending on where we are, you know, Tuesday X factor and X factor could be event specific day as well. So if my, my jumps coach needs to work the high jumper, then he's, he, those guys don't come with us. Um, throws are kind of a separate program. They do whatever they want. And then of course the distance guys, I don't think we need to really say much more. They're, they're just doing their thing all the time. Um, sometimes they do drop in and do some max speed with us, um, which is cool on the front end of, of, uh, the season. Um, but then Wednesday off Thursday, I might even come back with, uh, you know, maybe it's a 10 meter fly. Maybe we do three of them go home. And then Friday we do a pre-meet, nothing super high intensity. Um, and then Saturday invite, you know, and again, that's not like cut locked in, you know, this is what we do every week. It, it, it does change. We listen to our athletes, um, you know, and then we use that meat as a workout. Looking through some of your other stuff, uh, summer stays just as busy for you between speed camps and then, uh, Friday night track meets. How do you get the buy-in for that? Because other sports are starting to pull in, you know, summers there. Kids are wanting to do anything a lot of times, but, uh, but go to practice and do those different things. How do you create the buy-in to get athletes to those events? Well, before I jump into that, I, I'd like to say I went down to um, Tennessee when Tony Holler lived down there, um, and I watched his speed camp. And I left, and I asked, and I said, "This is this is all you do?" <laughs> He's like, "Yeah, that's it. We run forties." And I time them. We do speed drills in the front. We do forties. They may have another station or something, and then they go home. And I get all kinds of kids. And so, when I moved to Edwardsville is when I started our speed camp. And uh, so, you know, just promoting that uh, with just in general our high school kids trying to get them to come out. Um, and then, you, you know, over the years, it's it's. Uh, our kids started the summer track meets. I mean, uh, my boys were in the heat of it and I probably started it for them to give them a summer activity and, and just introduction to track and field. And that's our main goal. Um, and our, our numbers from two to nine are probably the biggest numbers that we have. And, you know, just giving the community an opportunity, you know, uh, I think the last five years we've had maybe only 30 kids show up. But still, those families, it's its pretty cool for those kids to get to experience. And we turn the lights on on the track. And and uh, it's its mostly it's word of mouth. You know, I push some stuff out on social media. But um, I, I could probably make it bigger. But it's, uh, it's very family-like. You know, families are walking around. We have a, a family relay to end each night. And and um, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. And our high schoolers come out and help time. And. And, um, you know, the parents are out there videotaping their kids and, you know, some kids will finish the race and, and a lot of them don't. Um, but, and that's okay. You know, um, a lot of tears being, being shed out at the, the summer track meets, but, you know, again, just exposing them to the sport of track and field and word of mouth, um, and just our success, you know, people, people start to follow, um, when you're successful, they, they want to be around it and want to see what's going on. In an environment now that seems that kids are getting specialized so early, listening to you kind of talk, you try to keep a more rounded approach. You take what you can get to get them to the field, but make sure that they can do the sports they want to do. Do you think that maybe some kids are getting specialized too quickly? Most definitely. I mean, I, I found out with my own kids, you know, of course it started with the ball sports, uh, soccer and baseball and, you know, it, it got to a point with both my boys where, you know, the season would end in June or July, and then they're already talking about November, December going in and catching. And it, it it's just – it's gotten ridiculous. It really has. And, and if that's your passion, then so be it. But I was a multi-sport athlete. You know, I know things were a lot different in the 90s, and I, I get that. I understand that. But I still think kids are kids. 
and their bodies need to be respected. Their mental state of mind needs to be respected. Uh, social media has thrown a whole different loop on. Yeah, we want kids to still stay active. You know, we don't want them vegging on their phones. But you know, I think it's it's tough. And and uh, you know, I I always tell them try not to throw all their eggs in one basket. You know, I see kids down the road that I try to get to run track for four years and they played soccer and they're no longer playing soccer. Their dreams came to an end. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't throw that in their face, but I just keep saying, man, I would have loved to have had you. You could have been a complete stud, you know, and just trying to encourage, you know, when maybe they have kids, maybe it's a different approach. Um, but it, it is, it is tough. I feel like track and field a lot of times gets the leftovers, um, which I'm happy to have whoever comes and hopefully we can track the most talented ones and we, we can win them. I've had you on here quite a while and I know you would probably like a little bit of an evening, uh, ahead with your family. So let me kind of wrap up with this question to stay on top. You always have to be developing. How do you manage to keep growing as a coach and not just get comfortable with where you're at? Yeah, that's a good question. Something I probably haven't done uh, as good of job as as I should have these last couple of years. Um, but I think networking, you know, with other coaches, I think is huge. Um, coach Holler is my mentor. You know, he was my high school coach. I, you know, I think – everything he says, I, I'm, I still look at him and listen to him like I'm in high school. And, um, he's such a great speaker, such a great motivator. So I, I spent a lot of time just listening to him, but you know, I need it. I think important to network. I think it's important to go to clinics. Um, I think it's important to keep records of what you do. Um, I think it's important to communicate with your staff, um, to listen to your kids, um, what works, what didn't work. Um, we used to lift heavy in the, you know, 2012 to 2018, and we we had a lot of hamstrings. We used to squat a lot, and you know, so we've bought we've backed off, you know, max squatting. And so there's just things that have developed over the years where we've changed, and you know, there's just so much stuff out there available to us now. And you know, being smart with who you listen and who you follow, I think, is important. Um, and and so if you do those things and, and you spend time, uh, you know, down that road and try to stay in your lane and, uh, and listen, you know, I've, I've had my assistant coach, Ali Collar, just, he's disagreed with me on, he thinks we're doing too much or, or we should do this or that with an athlete. So you can't think that, that, you know, it all and, and listening, I think is, is super important. Um, and just seeing what, bad schools do, you know, like I'm not going to do that, you know, trying to stay away from that. But, uh, you know, again, if I, for any young coach that may jump on and listen to this, you know, networking, going to clinics, taking notes of what you do, you know, stay true to what you do and, and find, find your philosophy, you know, don't try to pretend to feed the cats and, and tell your kids to go out and do a two lap warm up Cause that's not feeding the cats. And I think that I think that sometimes we take what and how we were trained and try to implement new things. And kids can see pretty quickly whether you're truly into what you do. The, the kids nowadays are smart. They can look all these keywords up and it will give them an immediate answer. And so, you know, you have to stay on top of your game with with that too. And um so again, I think it's a it's a combination of things to continue to move forward as, as as teachers and coaches. I know we had a little bit of a rocky start getting everything hooked up and getting everything set up, but I'm glad you stuck with me and uh and hung out for the podcast. Uh I appreciate your time. I know how hectic things get right now and you got two boys that are probably running you running you ragged. So thanks for the time, coach. I really appreciate it. Steven, it was nice, nice talking to you. Uh it was nice meeting you. And uh, hopefully we'll cross paths at some point down the road. Sounds good to me, Coach. Great evening. All right, you as well. Take care.